This is a big crowd. All right, can you guys hear? Yeah, okay. Uh, well, thanks everybody for coming for the making of Venom talk. It's awesome. I can't believe there's so many people here, but that's great. And it's not just me, thank God. I brought the whole team here, the core team, plus a few surprise guests. Um, so let me introduce everybody there first. Um, so right here, we'll start with Kevin. Kevin, I can't say your last name. <laughs> Kevin K. Okay. Kevin's a mechanical engineer in the project, did an amazing job. He's hugely talented. This is his first game as a mechanical engineer, so definitely um, there's more to look for from the future. <laughs> yep. And then we have Paul. I can't say your last name either. <laughs> Paul C. There you go. Uh, Paul is, was in charge of all the video display, all the artwork, everything you see that cool that appears up there. That's Paul. Does an amazing job. Proud to have him on the team. <laughs> Jerry. Jerry Thompson. Thompson. There we go. I, I got your name. All right. <laughs> Jerry does the audio on the game, all the audio, the music, the sound effects, puts it all together, makes it all sparkle. So amazing job again. He's done a ton of games. You've probably heard all a million times. But And then we have this guy, Jeremy, here, which everybody probably really knows is Zombie Yeti. Um, yes. One of the most incredible artists in all of pinball ever, and you've seen his work on a million games. No, don't be laughing. You know who you are. <laughs> no, very proud to have Jeremy on the team. And here's our surprise guest is Mark Tremonte yeah. from Foreign From Creed, and he did music for the game. We were very honored to have him be part of the project. And he's also a huge pinball fan, which is awesome. <laughs> and then we have Corey. Stoop. Stoop. Uh, Stoop or Stoop? I would have said Stoop. So Story Stoop. Corey's um, a programmer on the team, extraordinaire. Um, works with Dwight really close. Uh, and he does all the really hard technical details that uh, get really ugly, right? Yeah, Corey. Is this on? Yep, it's on. Yeah, Corey's been my right hand man forever, and he's an unsung hero. Right, he's done all of the hard work on Venom, like like the fast locks. If you guys played Venom, of course you have, right? So all of the whole fast lock system, he made it work, and it was months of work for him to get the whole fast lock thing to work. Yeah, it looks um, seamless and amazing how well it works, but yeah. it, incredible amount of work and talent behind it. And there's probably gonna happen. be a slide on it later. So there probably is. You just yeah. ruined it. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's Dwight at the end. I, you know, whoever he's I some guy who walked in. Yeah. <laughs> You guys all know Dwight Sullivan, obviously has done a million games, an incredible talent in the pinball industry. So Thank you. definitely honored to have Dwight on the team. A million too, too many. Wait, uh, uh, no, damn. no, that's zombies. That's, that's zombies. It's Jeremy's Shit. line. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, well, let's jump in. Um, I'm going to move kind of fast through it, and I want these guys to talk a lot. Dwight and I kind of gave a presentation like this uh, down at Southern Fried, right? Yeah. So um, we got some special guests here today, so I really want you guys to hear from them too. Uh, but I'll walk you through how we made Venom, how we did it. And this is interactive. If people have questions, um, definitely raise your hand or just shout out a question. Hopefully at the end we'll have time for some questions too. So we kind of just went through this. There's a core design team I always call for a pinball machine. And these are the people who are there day to day working through all the hard stuff. Are we still counting Tom? We don't. <laughs> I still put Tom. Tom Tom's was part. Tom doesn't work for Stern anymore, we, we but he was Tom. still part of the project. We love he's him, and he moved on to bigger and better things. Right. He's, he started out the project, and then Kevin uh, came in. He took it over and did an amazing job. So, um, Jeremy, I didn't have a picture of you. I found the best thing I could. <laughs> that looks just like him. <laughs> uh, but besides the core team, there's an immense number of people behind the scenes who make a project work. They work on pretty much all the games from bill of material, just production side, artwork, support, um, even just people who help test and design games, all the video artists. Paul, you can certainly talk to that, right? You guys have a huge team. It's not just one or two guys. It's like 10 people who, who work on all the video art, and especially on Venom 2. It was very unique, so. Okay, so let's jump in. Where does it start? So for me, I think every designer does it a little bit differently. For me, I think you, you get a license, we define a theme, and I start with a blank play field. Um, some people start with something from the past or whatever, but I try to start every project with a blank play field. 
you know, diving into whatever the theme is and coming up with something unique for that theme. And very early on, Dwight and I worked together. So Dwight and I worked through a lot of stuff. Dwight, you want to talk a little bit about this whiteboard? Cause this yeah, is so this is, this is really like the first couple of days. This is just throwing stuff on the whiteboard. This is, so we were, this is what, what, what Marvel was allowed to give us. And Brian and I were going down, well, what's our story? What's, what's the motivation of the player? And what is he trying to do? And how is Carnage going to interfere with that? What's Carnage motivation and so forth? And we had this whole, if you know anything about codexes, raise your hand if you know anything about codexes. <laughs> Like, see, I told you, Brian. <laughs> one we person. got one. <laughs> right. So we didn't put c – we, 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 we were going down that path. We knew it. we were going to do this whole thing with you. And, and, it, and it was rules that I wrote in the game, and then I pulled them out, and then I put them back, and then I pulled them out again. And I left them out because nobody knows what codexes are. <laughs> so the codex – so this is just Brian and I trying to figure out what we're doing. And the one interesting thing there is in the center there that Grendel Knoll and the characters under it stage. Yeah, that stayed. That stayed I right from like right at the beginning. That that layout kind of stayed through yeah. the game. Yeah, and then the top right corner that was our team ups. Like so, the team up characters were going to be um, All right. Miles Morales, Hi Hybrid, Sleeper, and Captain America. Yeah. But then they told us that Captain America had to be Venomized, so then we changed him to be one of the unlock characters instead of Ghost Rider. Yep. All right. Let's move on. So play early playfield concepts. This is kind of where I start. This is AutoCAD. This is like the sketch in AutoCAD that eventually gets taken into SolidWorks and to made into real parts and products. But this is where I start. You can see some of these early concepts. That's the fast lock up there on the left center. Over on the right, we had this cool wheel thing that we ended up abandoning at some point along um, for the design development of it. It was kind of cool. It had multiple levels and layers and spun, and it did some cool things. But in the end, I think we picked other things to do. And then on the bottom, you can see Doppelganger. That's that's Doppelganger. He's kind of hanging out there. There looked like there was multiple Doppelgangers at one point, but <laughs> uh, that's the basic of the sketch for the for the mech. And then here's Carnage. You know, Carnage was there right from the beginning too. Uh, originally, Carnage, you look, he went all the way up and then he fell over the back. But that ended up being way too complicated to actually make work for the value that it gave, so we changed it up a little on the final version. Um, <coughs> so the changing shot, change your game, choose your host, change your game that we've been saying so much during the launch. I used to actually be a wheel, uh, the three shots that rotated, and each rotation did a different thing. But after going back and forth on the mechanical side, we determined it was just too hard to be able to level something like that in all four sides and dimensions to get it always flush with the play field. So I think it was a cool idea, but we d a lot of this stuff starts this way, right? We have a concept, and, and sometimes it works the way we're thinking. Sometimes it doesn't. Yeah, that, that thing, that's a wheel that rotates. And yep. And each, each, each time it stops, all three shots would be different. And you can see at the bottom the different shot patterns that we were looking to get. Uh, so sometimes we have to abandon a mech, but we still keep the, the basic concept that was there. Um, so, yep, so that was the first layout of the play field that was passed off to be moved into SolidWorks. And so while that happens, I, that gets passed off to people like Kevin and the mechanical side uh, to start working on. And then we're working on rule development, too. So this is uh, yeah, a plot really of the play field where we start playing with inserts and we start thinking about how could things work in the game with all these different mechanisms. Dwight, I don't know if you have anything to add. to. Well, we Cause yeah. There's some more slides we have. Right, that's, Here, that's that's a fun one. Those are Dwight drawings. So <laughs> that's that's so Brian and I are talking on Zoom and talking over email and 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 I say, hey, I, I just need a drawing because like what is because I'm trying to figure out I'm trying to figure out well what are all the combinations and how do they change depending on what what host we are? Because really early that was one of the early concepts back when we were showing you that whiteboard. Brian and I that's when we first started figuring out well we want to lean into this whole as you change your host the whole game changes that you know the lighting changes the music changes. And so forth, and and um, so then this is me trying to figure what the hell is going on. <laughs> <laughs> Each color is a different pattern, and it changed from host, that. But yeah. some of it stayed the same. So right, right. That's cool. And then that kind of got with the different characters here. We're trying to define right out. This is a much much later. This is more recent. This is yeah. So I found this program called a white, th you know, this whiteboard by Lucid Lucid Spark, and um, it's really great. It lets you throw ideas on a virtual whiteboard. And then you can go to any device and relook them up again. So this is just me, you know, making making little virtual post-it notes and then moving them around and figuring out well what's balanced, what's good, what makes sense. 
Yeah, and like you said, this was toward the end, but this was used during all during development as we swap things yeah. around and this played is the with final version. Layouts. And and um, it changed a lot over the over the months. Yep. Um, okay, so we're working on rules. Then we bring in Jeremy Zombie Yeti, and he starts working on the back glass. So he's going to cringe on some of these probably, but uh, you can talk a little bit about your process there. Those are very tiny sketches blown up very <laughs> big, so they look pretty bad. Uh, yeah, basically, um, I, uh, I get lots of uh, pictures with uh, colored arrows on them from Dwight, and I'm like, what is this? <laughs> and, uh, and then I just start sketching stuff. No, that's not true. Uh, yeah, no, we we all talk and we kind of discuss ideas and sort of you know directionally where we want to go. Um, when I start concepts and sketches, I basically there as you can see they're rough, but the idea is to kind of try to figure out you know how to create space and excitement and and uh, hopefully um, something that will uh, be so colorful people on pin side will complain, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and that's. My main goal. You didn't make them green, so I think we're okay. <laughs> <laughs> we had to talk them down from that. It's true. I did want to change Venom to green, uh, but uh, they wouldn't let me. <laughs> A small point there, you can see Carnage has that symbol on his head, but oh, yeah. that's one thing that Marvel did not want us to do. We borrowed heavily from the Maximum Carnage storyline, and they used those symbols on a lot of the symbiotes, uh, like Carnage, And but they said, no, that's not part of it. Take that out. <laughs> so. Mainstream, yeah, like people would expect Carnage. What else do we have here? Some oh yeah, early pros. Just, again, just more um, sort of as as the process went along, uh, trying to come up with, you know, again, ideas that hopefully help, um, you know, there's a lot of characters in this game. I don't know if you guys noticed that. I don't know if you know this or not, <laughs> but if you change the host... You change the game. <laughs> <laughs> Have you guys heard this? No, I'm kidding. So, so, so you know, it, 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 there's always a challenge when you're dealing with lots of characters, and in this case, you're dealing with a lot of characters that are very similar uh, in texture, and and usually, you know, we, we've got symbiotes. It's like a ton of symbiotes. So, um, trying to break up that space in an interesting and readable way um, is a very interesting challenge. Um, and so um, I would just go ahead and, and kind of, you know, iterate and come up with concepts, bounce them off these guys, and uh, hopefully what they liked stuck around. And if not, then I cried a lot. <laughs> it wasn't too much crying. I'm very <laughs> weepy. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. One thing I love about Jeremy is he adds action to a lot of his scenes, so they look very dynamic. And, and I will say also, you, you are the best person in the world at drawing Venom goo, i got to say. <laughs> I think I did there, it. I, there I is did a talent enough. there. I did it enough. That's what, <laughs> what else do we have? Uh, there's an early premium. Oh, that's bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's really bad. Uh, there's some premium along the way. That's yeah, closer yeah. to the end. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was uh, yeah that that one. Um, it's early, sort of flats color wise. Yep. Um, but uh, yeah, overall that was getting closer. Yeah. And the LE that was yeah probably your first real sketch of the LE. Yeah, that was the trying to sell the idea. Yep. Oh yeah, and then there's this thing called a play field. Are you guys <laughs> familiar with it? No, we um, we tried to leave Jeremy no <laughs> space to actually put art well, because it's a challenge. Otherwise, we don't want to make it too easy for so, him. So, so by the way, you'll see I do really weird things. So I, I'm not using value in the sketch phase quite the way I would normally use value. I kind of use it to separate and differentiate spaces, um, not necessarily for the sake of of depth or read of readability outside of the fact that I'm just trying to communicate the fact that this thing is not part of this thing. That's it. Uh, and in this case, if you see the yellow areas, um, one of the things early on I was trying to do is make sure that whatever was going on was framing so that the silhouettes would read of all those areas because that the, the area where you ensnare uh, on, on on those ladders where you sort of ensnare those bonuses, um, you know that was that's a huge thing. And Dwight Dwight had you know this great idea, and I'm like, how do I communicate that visually, and then communicate the fact that each of these represents a different shot, you know, or a different ladder path for a different character. Um, and so I was uh, very adamant as I was going into that uh, about how messy I was making it. And so I'm like, oh, I'm gonna throw yellow in here, and they're like, they won't expect yellow. Anyway, 
Uh, it sold the idea. Oh, also, I don't know if you know this or not, so, and uh, you can move on after this. If you choose a different host, <laughs> you'll change the game. Wow, thanks, Jeremy. You're welcome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I will say with you saying that is Dwight loves to make things complicated, so that is quite the <laughs> challenge for you. What? Well, you, what? You, you dared me to make Jeremy cry. <laughs> yeah. So I said, well, we have to add five more inserts. <laughs> well, <laughs> we, we, I actually gave you 20 bucks to make him cry a couple that times. That is true. That yeah. is true. No, no we, we actually did. We made some adjustments on uh, some of these inserts uh, yep. um, and stuff. Uh, to give but, you some but space. Overall, yeah, yeah, but overall it was, you know, it stayed pretty close. Yeah, you did an amazing job working within what we put there. Yeah. And it is a talent to clearly define shots and make it understandable, because if it's just a sea of inserts, it's just a mess. So Jeremy did an amazing job making that clear wait, for wait. everybody. So I, I've worked with Jeremy for a long time now. Um, Jeremy and I did Ghostbusters together. I've seen him at Stern, I, I think, grow as an artist. And, and um, I thought Ghostbusters was an awesome game, and I've seen every work become even better. Um, I thought Foo Fighters was the best work you'd ever done. And then I s and then, but now I think Venom is clearly the best work you've yeah, ever done. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Jack Jack Danger is in the audience, and he disagrees. <laughs> but, but uh, well, I appreciate that, Dwight. Who is better than Ghostbusters? That's it. Everything is better than Ghostbusters. <laughs> oh. No, no, I mean, I'm talking about I'm talking about the playfield art. The playfield art. That's it. That's it. All right, let's move on. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, so we've been working on the, the play field. The Kevin's been working on it for a while, and Tom at the beginning there, and, and now we need to actually build a play field. So this is the very first Whitewood. Uh, you can see on the right. On the left is it in SolidWorks. It's actually taking 3D form now as to something real, but it's just blocked out in a lot of ways. And the right side is a version of it, but there's nothing really mechanical yet. Right? It's just ramps, it's shots, it's for us to test out. Is, does this feel good? Do we like the way this is? Is this too narrow, too wide? Stuff like that. Um, so yeah, there's some close-ups. So, but you look at this, and a lot of it still stayed. You can see the right-hand side there. That was that was like looking like the wheel, kind of, right? But we had talked about making them two separate mechanisms, and that's what it did end up becoming. Uh, but most of the shots are still there that uh, uh, made it to the end. Can you go back to one, or two? one back, or two, two. One more. This one, okay. Still, you can see here the wheel is still in the box. Yeah, on the left side. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the, the gray wheel there in the center. Yep, yep, that's in there, too. So those are two big things that did not end up in the final. And usually there's lots of reasons for that. Um, sometimes it just doesn't flow with the rule side and the thought that we're having. Sometimes it's not reliable. We test and we decide, oh, you know, we're not going to be able to make that reliable or manufacturable, so we abandon things. Uh, more rule development happens. <laughs> Dwight, you have more. Yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, uh, so change the, uh, something about change the host and uh, th that was something that we wanted to do right <laughs> off the bat. Right off the bat, I wanted to, I wanted to figure out, you know, so this is color coded, right, depending on who you are. And it's not going to make any sense to anybody but me. But, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, 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 I like spreadsheets. I like documents. I like Google Docs. I put everything there and then I try to sort it all out and massage it as I go and then I, I use it as my Bible to teach everybody else on the team what we're doing. Yeah, and, and Dwight and I go back and forth all the time, right? We're constantly, and it's, it's, it's a healthy battle back and forth. You know, like Dwight wanted to call it, change your game, choose your host. And it, it just <laughs> was not working. It was months of convincing him. But yeah. he finally came around and, you know, seen the light. So yeah, it's, it's better now. Yeah. yeah, see, it works. Oh, oh, this is some this classic is Dwight um, drawing here, too. Yeah, this, 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 is, this, is, this is why I call up Jeremy at the beginning <laughs> of the project, and I say, Jeremy, man, I need your help. So that's me laying out, this is me storyboarding what the screen should look like. This is me working with Paul, right? So, Paul, this is me, me actually, it was, it was before you, right? This is before Paul. Paul, was, Paul came on a little bit, like not quite at the beginning. Um, we had a different lead at the very, very, very beginning. Um, but this is me laying out well, what the screen should look like at, when we're choosing a host. And then that on the right, so those mini modes, I, I wasn't sure that they were going to be two-way combos forever until we started playing it. So I started just laying out 30 different mini modes, depending on what host you were 
And in the beginning, they were going to change colors, and then I decided that's way too complicated. I just want yellow, blue, and white. And, and then I, you can see I'm rearranging where the flamethrower is going to go and where the plus one X is going to go, and what should we do there. Um, but again, that, that whiteboard tool is really cool. You guys should use it. <laughs> okay, but Let's Dwight. questions later. But Dwight, uh -oh. which character is which there? Which host is which? Because I'm having a little trouble. Making, so making the blue is your current host, and then this is so this is um, Tom Tom who should be up here maybe, but if we, we would need twenty people up here, right? right? right. So we Tom would. Tom uh, Kizavat um, yes. dr figured out how to lay out all of the hosts on a, on the top of a building roof, on the top of a building, and that's me telling them well as as we move the camera around to the different people, what should it be? What should it look like? Yep. Obviously. <laughs> 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 That's why you do the argument. Uh, so another big thing, Dwight, and I really wanted to do right from the beginning was use Insider Connected more. And oh, yeah. I think this has created a little bit of a stir out there, and it's kind of our first foray into to doing more with it to give people more variety and more options. And I think one of the, our big goals was there's a lot of stuff deep into a game that most people like me and Dwight and most of the people here can't get to. Right. So we wanted to find a way to, well, let's let everybody get there eventually. Let's yeah. like all the games count toward getting there. So we came up with the leveling thing, and that led us to, to a way for everybody to get to the end. Right. It was, that was, in fact, that was, that was the goal from the beginning. Like early yep. on, Brian and I wanted to make a game where, you know, the, the pinball enthusiast, normally it's the dad, brings the game home, and the kids can, right along with dad, eventually get to the end of the game. And then we said, well, how do we do that? And we worked our way backwards, and that's sort of how we came up with leveling and XP and, and so forth. And we were like, well, okay, well, we're just going to keep that as our goal and then focus everything around that. We thought about that, yeah, and I, I don't think it's that big a difference. I think, I think most people are saving progress. The only the only time that you're not saving progress is usually when you're in a tournament, and then that's right from the beginning anyway. So, I don't think it matters. L let's keep going. All right. All right. Did I skip one? Uh, oh, we're building another play field now. Okay, so that was Whitewood one, and now we're into Whitewood two. So this is more refined, right? We're learning more from playing the first one and deciding what we like and what we don't like. <coughs> and now we start getting some of the mechanisms that working for the first time, which really changes things too in the feel of, of the game. And this is the first time I think the, the locks are there on the right and left uh, that are actually functioning and working in the game. The wheel is still there, as Dwight pointed out before, the big gray wheel over there, that's still there. But you can see Carnage. Uh, on the left, he's still there. Uh, Doppelganger on the right, he didn't actually swing out at the start. So you can see it's just as a static thing. He just pulled down when he was activated and attacked. But we felt it kind of got in the way of the shots and it was a little hard to see. So we came up with a way to have him actually come out from the side. And I think that really worked out pretty well. He's, he's definitely a surprise when he jumps out at you. Um, yeah, you can see there uh, Carnage on the left. He's the mech is developing a little bit more. You can see the ball locks. You can see the wheel that we ended up taking out. Um, and this is what it looks like underneath. Uh, luckily, Kevin took a picture of this because <laughs> it's really interesting. The first white wood that we built doesn't have lamp boards and such, so we have to wire it all by hand. We have a group that does that, does an amazing job, Dave Godot and group and Jim. Um, but, it, but we call it a rat nest because, well, it kind of looks like a rat nest. <laughs> Oh, right, yes, you did have to do that once, too. Yeah, it's, right, it's so labor-intensive. We don't want to do that twice, but sometimes we need another play field, so we lift it off and move it. And Kevin had the fine job of doing that. Uh, this is, this is um, some Carnage stuff, Kevin, you want to talk a little bit about. So one of the mechs that Kevin developed was Carnage, and it went through a number of different iterations to get to where we actually ended up. So why don't you talk a little bit about that, Kevin? Yeah. Good voice, yeah. Okay. Um, 
Uh, that's better. Okay. Um, so when I joined the project, uh, we were kind of at this stage, this Whitewood 2 stage. So there was that big hole in the corner of there was an idea for Carnage, but where I picked it up was how do we actually make this idea work? So one of the ideas that we were testing here was uh, kind of a spring retract that would be underneath, which would also give us a way to um, track your progress infinitely along the, 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 the ramp instead of just at a couple of spots along the way. Um, yeah, trying to route that string through underneath in the springs, it, it, it didn't work. Um, simpler is better for things like this. Um, this was a very early one that used a magnet to hold things in place, and the, it, like the impact of the ball would make the magnet release. Um, also complicated, uh, you know, simpler is better. <laughs> what else we got? Uh, and then um, towards the end of the development of Carnage, we actually had uh, the gates that are on the on the top side there next to the Ravencroft archway, those gates actually used to close. Uh, we had an idea where the gates would close. You'd get Carnage all the way back and the gates would shut on him and, it, and then when he'd release, you'd have a bit of a uh, um, surprise element where he'd burst through the gates and come, come back and attack. Um, it was almost there but a little bit complicated and was 100% so we'd much rather um, you know, not have something that's going to lead to some problems in the game and just make it reliable. So um, I was sad to see that come out. I worked really hard on that. But you know, not every idea is going to make it in the game. But um, It's always you know, that balance between reliability and coolness. And we try to find the balance. So we don't want games breaking down out there. And if this broke down, it could have caused cars to get stuck. So we made the choice. You know, It's still cool to push them back there. We added some lights and still made it really cool. <laughs> This was our tiny dance. Oh, maybe it's a little <laughs> soon for that one. Okay, let's move on. No, these are the sculpts. <laughs> you, you want to talk a little bit about the sculpts? Uh? Yeah. yeah, so that, that other picture there, um, you, I'm sure you've all played a game Deadpool. Um, the Dazzler sculpt just happened to be very similar to the Carnage sculpt position and size and weight. Uh, and dropped right into the mech so we could do some better testing early on. But um, you know, both mechs were were pretty highly detailed. Uh, I'm sorry, both sculpts were pretty highly detailed and and drop right in. You know, look like they're torn right out of the comics. Yeah, custom custom made for the game. Yeah. All right, on to other development. Okay, so. Um, our audio has been kind of going on throughout this too. Um, here and there, Dwight works really close with Jerry on coming up with uh, the sound effects and getting some initial stuff in so we can get a feel for the game. And I think your idea of having a different score for every host, when you choose your host, you change the music too. <laughs> Dwight? Yeah, so summer of 2021, Dwight's like, you know, Mark Tremonti's a big pinball, pinball fan, right? And I said, sure. He says, we got him. For Venom. And I was like, oh, awesome. He's like, so I'm thinking, though, he should be music for Eddie Brock. And then Flash Thompson should be, like, um, military. And Gwen should be, like, funky. And I said, oh, great. How about Peter's techno? And so we had that all nailed down. And I said, should, should it be separate sound effects for each host, too? And he goes, yeah, sure. I go, oh, I just hosed myself on that because I'm doing four times the work. So it's basically, basically four sound packages in one game. But um, the first things we heard were the shooter groove that you hear now in the game from Mark. And it was just awesome. And, um, I, you know, I'm going to let the rock star who is the star of the game tell you mostly about the music. But I'm glad to have you. And I think you did. I mean, we used him in other spots other than Eddie in the game. But you just made it really, you know, you tie it all together and great work and thank you for being part of the game. Thank you, yes. thank you very much. No, I, um, years ago I, I begged and pleaded with the guys, please let me in one of your machines. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm a huge pinball addict. And uh, so when I did my last record deal, I told my label, um, I'll only sign this deal if you let the, all my music be license free for the use in pinball. And they, they <laughs> said, all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Woo. yeah. So, so yeah, thank you. So they they agreed, and um, I wrote some original music for it as well. And uh, here I am. I got a machine with my music in it, and it's a dream come true for me. So thank you. Uh, that's awesome. Thanks, Mark. It really did exude that feeling of Eddie Brock too. It just was thank a perfect you. fit. Perfect. And, and 
since then, that since everyone has heard it, like I've gotten tons of people come to me and go, Mark Money was perfect for that. And, yep. and, I'll and, be and, perfect and for I'm your perfect. next machine too. <laughs> 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 was that a plug, Mark? <laughs> Yeah, we look forward to working with you in the future, definitely. Um, it's great to have a pinball fan who, who understands the game, who makes music, too, because it, you just get something that fits so much better. Um, and then speech we did, too. We wrote a speech script at this time. And uh, in this case, Marvel actually recorded, I think they did all of them, right, Jerry? Right. They, they did all the characters for us with their voice talent, and I, I think they did an awesome job. Um, it's always a little questionable on our side when we're passing it off to somebody else, sending them a speech script. Are they going to give the emotion to it, the excitement to it? But they nailed it pretty damn well. Yeah, we were pretty happy with it. Uh, so test fixtures, another thing that happens during development, um, you probably want to talk a little bit about this too, Kevin, um, about what we did for test. I think there's a movie. Yeah, so uh, you know, all of the mechs that are going to be used heavily in the game need to be verified and need to be tested. So we did separate test fixtures here for uh, the moving scoop, the uh, ball locks, carnage, and there was even one for uh, some ramps, and there was also one for doppelganger. Um, so these go through extensive testing. They're just running kind of all day, all night. Uh, hopefully still in the morning when I get there, uh, sometimes not. <laughs> but He's either uh, happy the rest of the day or really... <laughs> <laughs> it really set the tone for, right. the, for those, those days. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's kind of a, a puzzle in itself of how to make these work and cycle repeatedly. And, um, but you can't capture everything. It, there's always going to be some wild things that happen on a table, and, and you can't account for every variable, but we, we do the best we can, and I think, I think we did pretty good here. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, wait, there was a movie. Was there? Yeah, let's see. Oh, yeah. There it is. Hey. So <laughs> I think this video, the Carnage Test, you can see it just kind of runs over and over, but this particular one has the gates on it. So you see when it gets up to the top, the gates start to close, and you can push through them, and the gates put close a little bit more, and then once they're all the way closed and he comes back forward, uh, he kind of pops out like a peekaboo, and you know, Carnage comes back and attacks you. So. Yeah, very cool. All right. Um, a long line now, we have the play field, we have some of the rules, we're kind of, we have a, a direction for everything. So this is usually when display starts coming, all the display effects start coming in, and this is where Paul comes in and tries to make all of our crazy ideas appear on the screen somehow. So Paul, I have a few slides for you to kind of talk through. Um, yeah, so these are just a bunch of images that were inspired um, from Jeremy, actually, from all the playfield art that he did. Um, so these are all 3D renders with tune shaders, um, because it's really challenging to match Jeremy's style, because he's just on another level. And he uh, cries a lot. So, <laughs> right. So what we had to do is mimic his style using 3D characters, um, and then we could pose that from there uh, with tune shaders, then we paint over that in Photoshop. Um, with Jeremy's reference. All right, let's, I got a couple more. I think um, this is an early interface. Yep, yep, no. these are backgrounds and these were all done in Blender. Um, and these are all inspired by Marvel and the, and the whole universe uh, in the comic book. Um, and also this is all inspired by Jeremy's work as well, as far as color tone, uh, color theme. Um, and we just added a little bit of motion to give it some life. Yeah, one thing I'm really proud of is the game is very cohesive in the art style. The display right. looks like the artwork that Jeremy drew, and everything kind of works really well together. And th this is early on. This is one of the first things we do is the interface, so it starts to give the whole game a feel once that gets in. And so one thing, one challenge is getting all our brains in sync of all our amazing ideas. And classic Dwight, he's got so many incredible ideas. Um, so one way we unify us all is, is doing storyboards and sketching it all out. Um, so this is um, Tom's amazing work of uh, the character select. But doesn't it look just like my drawing from before? <laughs> it's <laughs> almost <laughs> identical, Dwight, almost. <laughs> yeah. Right, so, uh, so the amazing thing about our team is we're so diverse in our talents, um, and we're so lucky to have Tom to have such amazing talents in, in the, the comic book realm. Um, to, to f you know, 
bring and just being a huge fan, right? Of right, that whole world. He fan. helped us in a lot of different ways. Um, so this is an early uh, sketch, black and white sketch of the character select. All right. Oh, there it actually moves. <laughs> Right. Yeah, it just adds a lot of fun to the game. And these are a bunch of boards, and again, this is all to get everyone's brain in sync of what we're shooting for. Um, and a lot of times, we don't even go into real production until we approve all these. And a lot of times, we put in sketches into the game just to nail down the timing and make sure everything that Dwight needs is in there and all the parts that Corey needs is in there. Um, then once that's all said and good, then we're comfortable as an artist and a team of about 10 to go into production full steam with confidence. Yeah, Paul and I make, Paul and I make huge spreadsheets of, of, you know, of all of the storyboards we need and, and where they are in our progress and what, what are we after that. And it's, it's a whole pipeline that has to happen. And it has to stay organized right. or we never get it done. Yeah, there's, a, there's a lot of moving parts. Everything. Um, being organized is so important, and we're lucky to have Dwight. He's extremely uh, organized. To a fault, something. <laughs> <laughs> Stop your crying there, J Jeremy. <laughs> um, yeah, and the other thing that we haven't really talked about much is all this has to be approved by Marvel, too. So even though we come up with all these cool, wild ideas, everything, all these storyboards, play field, artwork, everything Jeremy does, music, everything has to be sent to Marvel. And they have to prove that, I guess, this is Venom worthy. Uh, so there was a few changes. What changes did we have, Paul? The, I think they didn't want weapons. Um, obviously, they don't, you, they, you, they don't want blood. They, they don't want blood. They never want blood. Yeah. Um, yeah. We, we never planned for it. Did, do you have any more details yeah, on that, actually, Dwight, and what changed? Um, Agent Venom couldn't shoot a gun. Shoot a gun, right? right. That's what yeah, it was. So yeah. no, no, none of the characters could shoot a gun, and they didn't want any. And Wolverine couldn't slash anybody. You know, he could slash the air or whatever. <laughs> but he couldn't cut somebody in the ribbons. Right. So sometimes when you th see things in games and you're like, well, why did they do that? <laughs> sometimes it's out of our control, too. And th that's a really good reason why we sketch things out first and get yep. approvals early on before we do all the grunt work and production. All right. Uh, I think that's it. Okay. Um, so that goes on for, what, probably four or five months, six sometimes, sometimes even longer, you know, depending on the complexity of the game. One thing unique about Venom is they had to create everything pretty much from scratch. Some games we get like footage like from movies and such, but this game they had to create everything from scratch. All right, so we're on our last Whitewood and this is looking a lot like the final game. Um, you can see it now in SolidWorks. It's very detailed. It's got a lot of the components in. Kevin's been slaving night after night <laughs> trying to make it all right. And then on the right side there, that is the play field built up. And that pretty much has all the mechanisms. I think it's still missing doppelganger there, the swing out doppelganger versus the static one. Uh, but it's pretty close at this point. It, it, at this point, for something to change, it would have to be a major reason. We finally got rid of that wheel. Yep, and the wheel's gone. Yeah, <laughs> you can see the billboard that's there for status instead. Uh, just see some close ups of it. Um, and here, this is, this is old too, but <laughs> we were, we're refining the rules the whole time. This, this probably isn't even final. I didn't even look that close. But you know, we try to sum it up. What are the key big rules of the game and on a sheet too so that other people within the company can kind of understand the high level things. I think Venom has a really deep rule set and there's a lot of strategy, which Dwight loves to add too to games and I love that too. So there's lots of different ways to play it, and, and that was our goal. Between that and Insider Connected, I think those are, those are two big things. And without breaking the fact that it's approachable, that anybody who even is just a novice player can come up and play it and still have fun. That's always, I think, one of our key mantras is everybody has to have fun. And it's gotten difficult, more difficult over the years with different models and people buying games at home, people putting games out on location that need to, to make money. It's, it's a wide range, and we're trying to please a lot of people, and hopefully we mostly hit it. Um, and this is another great, great um, <laughs> Dwight drawing. <laughs> and this kind of, this is amazing, actually, because it sums up the whole game. This is me trying to keep up with Keith Johnson. <laughs> That's, this is me tr trying to, because, uh, so, so the truth is, 
the truth is, when we all during the tell me tell me I'm wrong, Brian, but all during development, I kept saying I was I was constantly nervous because we were changing the paradigm from a normal pin. It's yeah. not a mode based game. Yep. It's a game where you have these paths and you're trying to pick out you know you're trying to work your way toward ten levels and beat this boss and then beat his boss and so on. And and we did purposely do that. Right? We, we wanted to make yep. something that was different. Yep, exactly. But then but I kept. I, so I had to draw this so that I could see that the game had some breadth. That like, like I'm like, like I, I needed to enumerate all of the different things that were in the game, so that I could sleep at night and go, okay, we're probably <laughs> making a game that has some stuff in it, and and that's that's why I made this. Yep, and that's that's why I love working with Dwight. <laughs> um, so now we're we're there. We're we're at the final game. We're the next. Ones are going to have artwork on it. Um, we call it a PV run, which is product validation. These are the first samples of the game. Usually we don't make that many of these. We make maybe 10 or so. But we made a lot of Venoms because we wanted to go to Comic-Con. We wanted to launch the game a little bit earlier than we would normally. But these are the very first images, the very first cabinets made, the first play fields that came in. And yeah, and there it is all together, right? A couple of the models. Definitely an awesome looking game. Uh, and now, now it's not so surprising you can go and play it out. In the <laughs> but when we did this before, you couldn't uh, see the game. It was brand new. Um, so we launched, and we did launch at Comic-Con, which was a pretty cool experience. Uh, definitely a great place to launch as far as comic book fans seeing it. We had a, a giant room at Comic-Con where players could just come and play all sorts of stern games, and that's where we premiered it. On the main show floor at Comic-Con, we also had a couple games there right as people, thousands, I mean, Comic-Con is amazing. Quarter million people that go, people walking by, playing it. It was a really cool experience. And this is one of my favorite photos, because uh, Dwight Knight did Mandalorian. He happened to come to the booth and play Venom, so I thought it was cool. And that's it. That's what we have. So we can, 10 minutes? Great. So we got a few minutes left, so questions. What do we got out there? What do you have? Dwight, Dwight's version or the final one? Yeah, well, both, OK, OK. You can't, can't tell them apart, right? Yeah, uh, OK. <laughs> mm. Oh. Mm. Yeah, so, so Denai, Denai was the lead before Paul, like like super early on. Then Denai had, Denai had to go do some other things. But um, that those are those are how many balls you have left. Those are how many lives you have left. They, he was trying to make it the little the little venom heads. Can you go? Can you go back? Can you find it? Do oh on the selection screen. I don't know. Let's see yeah, if it's there. You want you want the the UI? Yeah. So right. So that's that's it's ball one, and and this is just this is just a sketch, right? So that's ball one, and, and according to this, you have over five plus live balls left in the game. It's how many live, it's, a, it's, a, it's an old video game thing where you would, it would show you one and the two and then three little ships, and that's how many more lives you had. And then if you had, and then at some point it would be a, like a big ship, and that meant you had five. But we just did the plus symbol. And if, so if you, if you set Venom to 12 ball play, you know, and <laughs> it, it'll, it'll show you how many lives you have. We wouldn't suggest that, but if no. you did. <laughs> no. Go ahead. Somebody over there. <laughs> All right. What do you got? Yes. They're always there. They they will play it during development. They will give feedback. Greg's super involved. Where's Greg? Where's Greg? Is Greg, Greg here? here? No, no. You're the guy in the house. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> well, go ahead, Jeremy. Oh, sorry. Uh, there, no, I work with Greg on a daily basis. We talk. Um, he uh, he's constantly bossing me around, uh, <laughs> punching down at me, <laughs> telling me telling me to add like. Oh, oh, That's he is true. here. That's he's hiding. True. That's a good yeah. point. <laughs> We did, yeah. We talked briefly about it, but yeah, they are. I, you know, they were there from the beginning. They were meant for two things: one, so you could see the status of how many balls are actually locked physically there, and one to get that fast transfer of balls out. 
And we weren't sure that was going to work at first, and we didn't know the extent that it could work until we actually started doing it, right? Yeah, so I spent, I spent like three man months trying to make it work, and I failed. And so then I handed it off to Corey, who then spent another at least three more man months, and he then succeeded. So tell us all about it. <laughs> when you, when you work for uh, when you work on games, uh, you do different parts. Sometimes you're doing rules, sometimes you're doing display, and then other times fun things like this come along. Where these are what you, as an embedded software engineer, this is what you really enjoy doing is solving this problem. That we've uh, w the example was well, next generation had a staging mechanism sort of, but you didn't see it. This is going to be all invisible. There you're going to make a shot. It's going to go into a completely different mechanism and then it the next thing is going to come out it was a amazing problem to solve it really was and ha being able to see it uh, and watch people play uh, is absolutely uh, a thrill so hopefully you all enjoy it <laughs> uh, we had their their multi ball okay multi ball is a very hard problem to solve um, the, the, the games that have done it very well make it look easy, um, but it's, and so having to keep track of all the states of balls are sort of on the play field, but they're not, and they're on the locks, but they're not, uh, was very challenging. Um, and so we were able to, to, to come up with that, besides all the other stuff in the game that we also solve. It's like, make a 2D fighter. Okay, we'll do that too. Okay, make, you know, solve these other issues. Um, we, at one point, the artist, we got to Grendel. And Grendel, you know, we were used to the characters being this size on the screen, and Grendel is this big. Uh, so it's like, okay, solve that now. And, you know, we worked with the artist. It, it, was, a, it was a great game to work with. Yeah, I mean, the, the fact that, like, on most locking devices, there's a switch that tells you steady that a ball's there. And you always know it's there. You can read all those steady state switches and know where all the balls are. Right. On this game, you don't know always because there's yeah. balls transitioning and moving between things. And to keep track of all that, I, I don't even know how Corey did it. <laughs> right, that's, Brian, 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 that's the right answer. Is yeah. Normally in, normally in multi-ball, a ball comes, the Opto sees the switch, we count all of the balls. We, it, for, in that moment in time, we know exactly where everything is. And we can go, okay, the player has two balls locked, one ball in the play field, and three balls in the trough. And, and then we can then proceed to go with whatever makes sense. In this game, in this game, a ball is rolling down the slide. You drain the one that it kicked a second ago, and it goes to in ball, right? Even though balls are in play, sort of, and, and we can't count anything. And it's a lot of magic that Corey pulled off. I, I think this made you cry, Dwight. <laughs> I think this it was did. your, this was yours. I mean, you were really frustrated I, I, for I the longest really time. I worked really hard to try to make it all work, and then I almost gave several meetings in yeah. a row. I was like, "Look, guys, we might have to punt on this yeah. whole." Th you know, we weren't even calling it fast locks then. Right. It was just, you know, we we might have to punt on the whole thing. And Dwight likes complicated things, so imagine how complicated this was to get working. And Corey did an incredible job, and the game wouldn't be the same without it. So thank you, Corey. <laughs> All right, anybody else? Any other questions? One over here. Yeah, this was a special case um, because they needed to get James Bond out, so we actually did get a little extra time. But what was it, Dwight? Do you know? Like, almost two years, yeah. Yeah, you need to be ready. Yeah. <laughs> then my job becomes just keeping everybody fed. Like, like all of the artists are doing work, and Paul's getting shit done, and and our job becomes just managing all of that instead of actually typing a lot of times. Yeah. So, but to answer your question, generally it's 14 to 16 months. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Way in the back. 
Oh, absolutely. It's like Dwight was saying, he's, he couldn't sleep at night sometimes. <laughs> I had to talk him down a few times. Uh, anytime you try something new that's like out of the norm, you can break new grounds and do exciting things, but then you get all the arrows in your back, too, of trying. That Right, that's why codexes, like, like I kept saying, well, maybe we need codexes because, you know, we need more stuff in this game. And, and then we would, and then it didn't make any sense, and it's not, it, it, we, I'm glad we pulled it out. Yeah. But that's why I kept putting it back, because yeah. the game felt like it needed more stuff. That's where, like, Toxin Team Up came from, and, and right, right. other stuff, right. That wasn't right. there initially, yep. Anyone else? Do we have time for a couple more over here? Yeah, you know, they can go various ways and different between designers, but we generally start with the premium as the base um, because it's a little easier to, like, take things out that we can't. And we want to keep the games close enough rule-wise. So it's, it's a balance. And we go back and forth on what makes sense between the different models all the time. Yeah. I, I, the, the premium is, the, is, is today's game, right? Like, so Brian and I both worked on pinball in the 90s, and I think that if they never invent it, Pro Premium and LE, and we just took games from the 90s and kept going until today, you'd have the premium, right? right. You'd have, you know, an expensive game that, that has its full feature and got tons of shit on it. Right. <laughs> right. But we still have a pro model to make it more economical for people to put yep. out on location and stuff, and all the same rules, and we try to get the same feel to the game as best we can through it, too. So yep. I think they all serve a, a market that makes sense. <laughs> he does. <laughs> well, I, I, <laughs> I was going to say Jeremy, but... <laughs> oh, I, I bet Mark, Mark can probably... Oh. We have a lot of high-end players now at Stern. We have Raymond... Oh, I thought you meant just this team. Oh, with our team? Or are you talking that Stern? Oh, of our, oh, geez. Oh, that's Kevin, obviously. Yeah, Kevin, Kevin yeah, actually Kevin's, is a tournament player. Yeah, and he's playing yeah, in the tournament right and, now. So, yeah, hopefully he's still <laughs> in it. They, they haven't kicked him out. <laughs> We're All right, one more in the back time. there. Yeah. I can't hear that. Oh, we can't talk about the future. Sorry. <laughs> we can't. I mean, I think Gary was here a minute ago. He, I could get fired like that. Like <laughs> Seth was here. I, we can't talk about the future. We'll leave it at that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we're probably out of time here. So thanks, everybody, for coming. Hopefully it was fun.